Mighty God, touch my lips of clay that my words may not be just my words, that we all may gain inspiration from your Holy Scripture. Amen. Now comes the hard part. I preached last week on wisdom and wisdom literature and that whole body of, of writing in Holy Scripture, and not just in the Christian and Jewish Scriptures, but across the board, which deals with wisdom, especially the wisdom of God, which is truth, real truth, not just fact, but the meaning beneath fact, the truth beneath appearances, what you might call metaphysics, that branch of human thought that deals with the reality that applies beneath the appearance. Now, if we're going to talk about God's wisdom, then we have to talk about things which don't immediately become obvious to us. We're going to talk about things which are not staring us straight in the face, things which don't seem logical to us, things which go against what we are taught, not just by our society, and it's easy to cast society as a demon, but frequently it's us ourselves who tell us these things. And those close to us, those that we trust and those that we love, because this scripture has something that was hidden to me for many years in here. In Mark, we see, first of all, that there are three commandments when he's asked for which is the most important. He gives us three. The first one is God is one. God is one. Now, I thought for many uh, years why I had never really come across that passage. It's because I used to get all my Bible from the lectionary. And in the Church of England, God is one is not something that they tend to <laughs> they tend to have people reading out all the time because of course all the churches are called the Church of the Holy Trinity. And they have there is this arrogance amongst many religious teachers uh, that you regard everyone else as just too ignorant to accept the reality, therefore don't give them anything that's going to consume and confuse the poor devils. So uh, I got my church and I got my religion, I got my Bible through a lectionary, and God is one never seemed to be in there somewhere. But God is one is the first commandment in that. The next commandment is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. But the other one he gives us is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now I was told this, and it was given to me as a piece of pithy teaching, but the consequences inherent in it never appeared to me. In fact, much of the teaching I was given made the truth behind this impossible to accept, because the truth is, love your neighbor as yourself. If you do not love yourself, you cannot proceed to the most basic of Christian instructions. Love God and love neighbor. It all starts from this, love thyself. And much of the teaching that we are given makes it impossible to love yourself. And to be honest with you, some of that teaching started out in great wisdom as a theological understanding of Scripture and became something which was a heavy burden laid upon people. The doctrine of the fall, for example. The doctrine of the fall, which was not there in the early church, and then became interpreted as meaning sex. Largely by St. Augustine of Hippo and then St. Thomas Aquinas became a burden that was laid upon people because not only are you fallen, not only are you fallible, not only are you weak creatures, but you have wickedness inside you. There is a filthiness, the undying worm that gnaws at the soul of mankind. That's hard to love. That's hard to love. And then, we start to understand that this love thing is more than just having warm feelings about someone. It's certainly a lot more than what our Western society takes as being self-love. It's not narcissism. It's not selfishness. It's something incredibly pure and profound. Something which is a reflection of God's love for us. Or in other words, a reflection of just the way the truth is in the universe. Because that's what God is. God is truth. Anything which is false cannot lead you to God. Anything which is foolish and cruel and twisted and unkind cannot lead you to God. And unfortunately, many of us twist and deform ourselves through self-hatred. And more than that, we have twisted and deformed our society through self-hatred. We have brought our societies and our countries and our nations to do terrible things because we are insecure and we are frightened. We are scared of the other. We are scared of the foreigner. 
we retaliate against those who harm us completely disproportionately. And then we live with consequences. And then we blame them again. We question why they hate us. Love is not just warm feelings. Love requires self-knowledge. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. But here's the killer. It keeps no record of wrongs. People have told me, oh, well, I forgive, but I can't forget. You haven't forgiven. Right. End of story. Begin yeah, again. You haven't forgiven. And the amount of people I know who get up here every week and say their confession and hear that they are forgiven by God, and yet every day they think over and over in their minds all the things which they've done, which they wish they hadn't done, all those things which gnaw away at them. Sometimes, in my own case, things which I did 20, 30 years ago, which still have me lying in bed at night with my skin prickling, thinking about what I did. I do not love myself. I am coming to love myself, and it's the most profound change in my whole life. Because, ladies and gentlemen, I had a revelation on Wednesday. That revelation was startling to me and a little heretical. You ready to hear some heresy? <laughs> I needed to get out of town, and I needed to clear my head, perhaps for the last time. And I drove, and I drove north. And on Monday, I drove a long way north, and I got about as far as um, just north of Champaign, Illinois, and I stayed for the night, and then the next day, I drove even further north. And I ended up in Lorium, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, the Keweenaw Peninsula. And on Wednesday, I went to the banks of Lake Michigan, the Lake uh, Superior, next to a orthodox skeet. I don't want to be sniggering. A skeet is a very small monastery in the orthodox church with just four or five men or women in it. And this skeet is on the banks of Lake Superior and they have a bakery attached in a beautiful church with gold money windows. And I walked along the banks of Lake Superior looking at this extraordinary view with a forest coming right down to the edge. And it hit me. I looked at the view, and I knew it was perfect. And I looked at the ground, at the dead leaves, and I knew they were perfect. And I looked at myself, and I knew I was perfect. I don't mean perfect as in complete. I don't mean perfect as in finished. I mean perfect in the same way that seedling is a perfect plant. A plant doesn't only become a plant when it flowers and bears fruit. A plant is still a plant when it is a weak seedling. A plant is still perfect in each of its stages as it grows and develops. It is still perfect and part of God's plan when it withers and dies and perish and returns to the soil from whence it came. And in the same way, I was transitional, was changing second by second, and perfect second by second, was still wanting to bear fruit. You are perfect. We may be uncomfortable. We may not actually like what we see. We may not like what we see in our, each other. But you know, ultimately, it's not our opinions that count. Ultimately, it is the God view of each of us. The God view of ourselves which counts. And the God view is that we are perfect. We are knit together in our mother's womb. We are as intended. We are part of God's will. We are fulfilling God's will. You know, there's a lot of dualism coming to Christianity. A lot of really damaging dualism, which isn't really Christianity. Now, dualism is splitting creation down the middle. It's splitting what is truthfully God's down the middle and dividing one side into the dark and one side into the light. Well, there's a word for that, and it's called Zoroastrianism. And it's a religion all on its own. And it ain't Christianity. And it has the light 